So, um, I guess it's time for uh, us to retire Wiki page now. <laughs> and then uh, next week on Monday, you have your first lab, Monday and Tuesday. Please check your lab sessions. If you're assigned in lab 01, it's Monday. If you're in 02, it's on Tuesdays. Labs are super full. We don't have enough of, uh, we don't have no extra seats for those who are swapping the labs. And you're going to run into problem for grading as well. Um, so, again, I'll, I'll re I have received many emails about the labs. I'm going to uh, iterate another time. Uh, so, before each of the labs, around two, three days before the labs, say on every week on Fridays, I'll post the pre lab PDF for you guys on Moodle. You can download it, you can play around with it, you can see what's going on. Uh, you can use the R RBS simulator on your laptop. You can connect remotely to the machines. You can go physically to the labs and run it and see uh, how does it work, how does it feel. And then you have to physically attend the labs either on Monday or Tuesday. Half of the session, you're going to run that pre-labs. On each of those uh, assignments, you're going to submit the files. We'll let you know on Monday and Tuesday. I'll be, I'll be personal there, so you don't have to panic on how to submit that. If the instructions are on the wiki page, I'm, I'm going to migrate them to, the, uh, to Moodle. And then after the half of this, uh, after we reach the, the half of the, the lecture, we're going to turn the machines into lab test mode, so you don't have the access to the outside world, and it's just you're going to be treated as a sort of a mini exam. So the rest of the questions that were the questions of your lab, you just have to run it on the simulator and then save the files and then submit those files as well. And yeah, that would be all. So this process will be continued for four weeks lab A to D, and then we have one makeup session before the, before the reading week and, or perhaps after the, uh, the, the reading week and on the midterm week, and then we're going to start the, the last four labs for you guys. So the last four labs, we use that Verilog simulator, that, 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 that compiler, uh, Icarus. Yeah? So you said you can swap labs? No. If, if you check the, so uh, the number of assigned students to lab are like right at the edge of the lab being full. Um, so it's going to be sort of unfair for the other people who've been assigned to the lab. Uh, send me an email. Let's see what we're going to do for you. Perhaps your issue is not, you know, uh, among the rest of the people. So perhaps we can work, work around. But I, I, I do ask to you guys to just attend your own session. Yeah. Is the midterm in class? Or yeah, class? it's gonna be. Uh, it's gonna be in the class, perhaps. But we'll we'll see. We'll see. There's no way you can uh, you can fit all in the same lab. Yeah. All right. So. Um, last lecture we we finished chapter one. It was sort of an introduction to the computer organization and architecture. You see. Uh, some of the metrics about how to, you know, um, calculate and compute the performance and with what angle we can look at the performance of the computer and specifically the CPU. So I'm just wrapping up here real quick. So as a recap, we were talking about the CPU time in terms of instructions per program, multiply cycles per instructions, and multiply seconds for each of those clock cycles that are taking, right? So if you combine them all in a more fine-grained manner, we're going to have a, a, a better CPU time to compute. And then we talked about the, uh, you know, dependence of performance over several layers of uh, computer organization, which are algorithms that are affecting ICs, programming languages, and compilers affecting mo mostly instruction counts and CPI, and then on the lower side, lower uh, lower end, you have the ISA or instruction set architecture that affects IC and CPI as well. So we wrapped up the previous lecture by saying that power is currently a limiting factor for uh, companies that you know fabricate chips and produce chips because not only it's not linear anymore is that you, you can no longer uh, be able to just you know increase the clock rate and, and expect your 
per, uh, you know, CPU to work just as fine with double the performance. Um, okay. All right. So the major concentration of the chapter two is around instruction set, right? We, we sort of naively talked about it in the previous chapter, so we're going to dig deep into how we're going to define instruction sets and how we're going to use it, right, for different sort of instructions, arithmetic instructions, control instructions, and so on and so forth. And how does those ISA look like in a, in a RISC-5 uh, ISA, right? Okay, so as a definition, we can say that Instructions and instruction uh, set is sort of a command given to a processor. Just think about it as sort of a vocabulary, right? So inst instruction set is your tools, is your vocabulary that you have in order to communicate between your hardware and software, right? So different computers, of course, have different instruction sets, right? But with many aspects in common. So uh, we have two set of different uh, ISAs, so RISC, R-I-S-C, and CISC, C-I-S-C. I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide. So although these two instruction sets are different, but you can find similarities between these two. Um, it's, it's sort of a metadata of a vocabulary that, that, that you want to use. And recently, many modern computers started to have more simpler, uh, you know, simpler uh, instruction sets. Although the, the, the majority of x86 Intel computers are still using that CISC uh, ISA as well. So I talked about the, the two types. So RISC, which we are focusing on in this um, you know, course, and CISC CISC. So RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, right? And we are learning about the RISC-5 ISA. So it is a fixed instruction size. So the, the width of your instructions are always fixed. And that's sort of a good, uh, you know, good aspect because it makes it much simpler. Um, your load and stores are much, much simpler. We're going to see examples later today. And if you want to compare RISC versus CISC, you see that the emphasis were on the more on the software side or the compiler side. Whereas the six is more uh, is you know, standing for complex instruction set computer. The lengths are variable. The instructions itself yield more powerful re results. However, they are much more complex to understand. Uh, it's not a good start, you know, if you want to learn an ISA, and they are mostly focused on hardware intensive instructions. So they need genuinely more transistors in order to run the same set of commands. So if you want to know that what type of computers are using I, uh, which of those, normally in Intel A, uh, x86 they are still using CISC. Um, but recently RISC has been you know, brought into life and there's a huge research community working on that as well. Okay. Another major difference between RISC and CISC is um, RISC is meant to be run, each instruction is, is meant to be run on one cycle. And this is a very uh, positive, I would say, point that it makes it much simpler if you want to, you know, learn or just analyze it. So you're sure that one, one instruction takes at least, uh, uh, definitely one cycle. Which, for which, for some of the CISC uh, they have some complex instructions that takes more than one cycle. So it makes it much more, uh, you know, harder to, to analyze and to start with. So, so what's risk 5 now in here? So risk 5 is, has started with a risk project in the 80s, but then 2010 they, they, they introduced it. They set up the, the risk 5 foundation. You can see the website here. So it's, it was developed at UC Berkeley as an open ISA. And now you have the uh, information all up available at your hand. If you have obtained a book, the, the first page of the book 
it has a, a green green card a green sheet so you can see actually it is it's working as a re, sort of a reference for risk five uh, on your exam perhaps we're going to copy that and you know uh, you can use it if, if you I mean because you don't have to memorize all of those um, so that was the question can you just explain what ISA is? ISA is actually instruction set architecture. So that, that's uh, what we are talking about. So in just one slide, you're going to see one example of that. But IS, instruction set architecture is sort of a medium you want to communicate between hardware and software, right? So think about those instructions as sort of a vocabulary that, that, that you want to use in order to communicate, right? So instruction set architecture is the whole set of the architecture you have set up in order to communicate between hardware and software, okay? So, let's see a very simple example of that. It's, it's, it's an, an arithmetic operation, so could be add, subtraction, division. So this example has add, right? So we want to add two variables, and we want to save the result in a, in a third one, right? So in risk 5 the way we do is we have two sources and one destination, right? So when we use add a comma b comma c, it actually tells the hardware to add b plus c, right? And store the results to the destination which is a. So just you have to read it this way. So a gets b plus c. Right? Question? Okay. So all the arithmetic operations have sort of the similar uh, you know form, except the fact that their operation, their respective operation is different. Could be sub, could be uh, many sort of division, could be shift, could be add i, and you can have a look at your green sheet so uh, it has listed all the instructions. The number of instructions provided in an ISA is limited, right? You cannot just devise a new uh, instruction. It should be implemented in the hardware because the hardware at least need, needs to understand that, right? You need to have the compiler to generate that for the hardware. So, as you see, this is a prim uh, it's a very intuitive, it's, it's very simple, and you know when when you are dealing with complex uh, scenarios, always simplicity, as you see, favors um, regularity. So. The, the maintenance is easier and it's kind of lower the cost. Okay? So now in, uh, in a second, we, we, we're going to see a, a more sort of complex or a com compound um, instruction set. Okay? So say we have this C code, F is equal to the addition of G plus H minus I plus J, right? So if you compile it, you can even uh, try it at home or um, using your, your R RVS simulator and you pass it there, you pass this and you see the, the hex dump of the results. So when you compile this high level language, a C like code with the uh, RISC V compiler, that's what you get as the output. So it's going to break this compound uh, this compound line as to first it's going to add these two variables store them in a temporary register we call it T0 here then it's going to add the second compound here i plus j that's what the second line for and it's going to store it in T1 another temporary register and then at the end it's going to subtract these two, okay? So for this very simple C code, we need to have three instruction code. Yeah? Uh, why is it at the end where it says add F T0 T1? Yeah. Wouldn't that add both of them instead of subtracting? Subtracting. Oh yeah. The, apparently the, the author of the slide had a huge typo, right? Yeah, this, this is a... Uh, this is, of course, this is up. Yeah, let me see if I can fix it right now. Let me check. 
Turkey Beach. Elsewhere as well. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll double check the rest of the slides later, but if you found a typo, just let me know. Okay, let's carry on here. So now, we, we broke the com compound um, C code instructions to two adds and one sub, right? Now, as you notice, the arithmetic instructions, they use register operands. So, these T's here are representing one of the registers inside the RISC architecture. In RISC, you have 32 registers. Again, you can refer to your the green card and see all of those. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you know in the next slide. So, RISC-V has 32 registers. Each of those are having a 64-bit width, right? So, if you want to, like, visualize it, So it could be something like this. So you have um, pointer so say you have T0 to T31 and this is 64 bit right? This is pretty hard to write here Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's almost, almost like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Uh, so. Risk five has thirty-two registers. So those those rows that I intended to write, and then each of those have sixty-four bit, right? So each of those registers are meant to be used for, for specific cases. I'll, I'll let you know in the next slide. We cannot just randomly assign things to different registers. Each architecture has, you know, each, uh, has its own register, and each of those is meant to be used for different things. Um, OK. And here in RISC-5, we call 32-bit data as a word, right? So 64-bit, we call it double word. And the second design principle that we're talking about is most of the time, the smaller is faster because accessing it needs, uh, you know, lower um, latency. If you make it way, way bigger, first of all, your design gets bigger, your chip <coughs> spends, uh, consumes more power, and then accessing those, even in nanoseconds, is going to affect your, you know, performance. And that's why the closer the things are, ha are next to CPUs, like registers, and then afterward cache, afterward memory, afterward the hard drive, intrinsically, it's going to get slower. Although they have different architectures inherently, like hard drive has a different architecture than RAM. But being even, you know, bigger makes them slower. Yep. So the register file is like a quicker cache. That's right. They're way, way quicker. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when you write programs uh, in CISC as well, you can use, you can use uh, for instance, if you want to write codes on Intel, you can use intrinsic uh, that takes into account the SSE of the registers of Intel, right? Depending on the architecture, you can, use, you can just write um, assembly that takes into account the specific register, but this requires the knowledge of a compiler uh, developer or or a developer that knows what's on the underlying uh, hardware is. Otherwise, if you just use whatever compiler that you had and write C, high level C code or high level Java code, you're not sure if the compiler was sophisticated enough to take use of all those registers, right? This is one of the pitfalls. Anyhow, so these are um, a high level view of RISC-5 registers. So the first one, X0, meant to be used for constant value, right? X1 meant to be used only for return address. X2 is for a stack pointer. X3 is global pointer. So we're going we're gonna to touch on every one of those in a chapter as well. Um, X4 is thread pointer. It's going to point to the thread. So X5 
to x7, and 28 to 31 are, are temporary. So in a specific cases that you need to have temporary results stored somewhere, so you can use those. x8 is frame pointer. It, it, it sort of acts as, a, as, a, as an offset uh, for a stack pointer. Um, x9 and 18 to 27 can be used for saved registers. And the rest are function arguments. So um, later on, when we talk about more examples, you kind of you're gonna just learn them, you know, by heart that you can use. Uh, how how are you gonna use some of those, and you know how you can actually take the uh, the best use out of these available registers. Okay. All right, so let's see another example, the, um, the old code that we had, f is equal to the addition of g plus h minus i plus j, right? So now you see that the compile reads 5 code is going to use x5 and x6 because x5 and x6 were in the temporaries, right? So if we need to store temporary results for these two, here, the results of this and result of this, we can use x5 and x6, right? And then x19, you come back and see it was in the, where are you? Yeah, for the save registers. And that's for that, okay? Questions? So for x5, that would x20 and x21 stored in x5, right? Right. And x20 and x21, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I keep losing these safe registers. Yeah. And x20 and x21, their purpose is just to hold g and h right? Right. In this case, there are temporal values that, 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 that we are. g and h can be anything, right? Uh, by what do you mean by anything? Like any number or anything? If they were constant, you could you could you could have used the, the other one. Uh, there are variables containing so there are variables actually. Okay. If they were constant, you, you would have used another register. Yeah, okay. because anything means uh, yeah. You have to just specifically mention that what that is exactly. Yeah. I say the same code has four variables. Are they uh, mandatory to restore in? Uh, the order of 19, 20, 21, 23, or they can store in any. You know, it, you, got, you got a code saying yeah. it is in those stars, so we are using it. Yeah, very good How question. Yeah. Know, where do we call it? yeah, good question. In this case, since the uh, <laughs> dependence and, and, and the precedence doesn't matter um, because it's just two adds and one sub, yeah, you could have just swapped x5 and x6 instructions. But sometimes you need to have the order because you need the results available. And just Think about a, a, a longer compound that had like 20, 30, right? So yeah, simply you're going to run out of your temporaries. So you have to wait for the first one and then perhaps, um, you know, uh, add, add, add the, the next two with, with the first one and, you know, it just go one by one or one by two and then two by one again and go on and so forth. So it depends on the code you have, right? Professor, you still don't? X6, can I use X19? Not everywhere, but given the, the knowledge that was presented up to now, yes. Yeah. But, yeah. There are some instances that you can't. Okay. Sorry, what yeah. happens when you run out of steps? You have to find a way either to um, store the, the upcomings with the current temps and store them in, in, in the next temp. Or if we just have like 25 of those, uh, it's going to take a longer time. You have to wait for the result of the first one. Because okay. at the end of the day, this, this doesn't have any end, right? If you even had 32,000, some but would just come back, okay, what, what about this formula? Like you had like 2 million. Yeah. At the end of the day, you have to find a way to figure out. Yeah. Um, where do you, where do you store? 
When? Yeah, because in, in so this is sort of, this is decided sometimes by compiler, and sometimes you can add optimization to that. If you don't actually need the, if you don't actually need the result of G plus H, and you just get rid of it after the the final sub, you can store it in temp. Otherwise, if you were if the compiler when the compiler parses a code, it understands that how many times and what was the last occurrence of one one variable. If it didn't invoked anymore, you can just get rid of it, right? These are the optimizations that compiler add. But if you want to write it by hand, as someone who just writes assembly by looking at C, these are different versions you can write. Your code would be a little bit slower then. Okay. That's so all. for example, if, uh, if the information that we get is like stored, um, one way to save it to memory, is a better, better practice to keep it in a safe registry? Yeah, because uh, when you save it into memory, you, you, you'll, you'll pay some penalty in order to access it again because you have to load it, right? Yeah, good question, yeah. Okay. So by now, I hope that you saw even small arithmetic functions are very delicate, right? There are many ways you can, uh, you can run them. All right, so now let's talk about the memory operand or yeah. Here, in risk five, we have um, sort of a sort of an agreement, sort of a um, a rule of thumb that is little endian. So what does that mean? So that means that least significant byte is normally at the least address of a word. I'll have an example in the next slide, so you'll see. How, uh, how that works. So the, the contrast to, least, uh, to, to little in the end is called big in the end. So some of the other architectures are working that way. And that shows, uh, that represents actually when the, we use the other way around. So the, the most significant byte uses the least address. So when we start addressing those up codes, we start from bottom up instead of um, Top, uh, top bottom, top to bottom approach. Okay, so let's see an example here. So actually, when you have this 32 bit, right? We call this this byte because each byte has eight bits, right? You have four bytes. So the first on the left is called the most significant byte, right? On the left side. This one on the right represents those eight bits. is is called the least significant byte, and we have thirty-two or four bytes here, right? So say we want to store this value, this hex, to address twenty, right? When we are using a little in, uh, little Indian uh, architecture, so it starts from the the address that had to be started. And then it's going to put the values from the least significant byte, right? So D4 here, C3 here, B2 here, and then A1 here. Okay, and it goes on and on. On the other side, if it was um, a big Indian architecture, it would go the other way around. It starts from A1. Okay? It's pretty um, intuitive. Just don't get confused about the names and, you know, because at the end of the day, when, when you, you need to have sort of um, um, rules in, 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 if you want to, you know, parse them. Because you need to have some ordering fix. Otherwise, your, somebody would just read the other way around and you have um, an invalid value, right? Is it clear? So just to oh. reiterate, um, this address is too complex to store into one single byte. So it is breaking it up. And there's two different ways it can break it up. Uh, basically, one is reversed to the other one. Is right. Okay. Yeah. And um, what makes it least? What defines least significant and most? Significant? So when when you define numbers, right, in, in in binary or in general in in a decimal. Um, so in a decimal word, 
So you have like, I don't know, eight, five, six, two, right? This is the most significant side of the number because if you change this, it's going to impact the whole value a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is this most and this is this least. So go back to your binary case, but treat it, each of those treat it as eight bits or one byte, right? So you have one byte over there, one byte there, and then two bytes in the middle. And each of those bytes have, you know, eight bits. I want to make sure all of you got the idea. Is that clear? So in the example, uh, so the B4 must be the last significant. Oh, the, the least, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's the way risk 5 goes. It's, it's, it's the convention for that. Yeah, in risk 5, we, we address 8 by bytes by bytes. Yeah, exactly. We go bytes by bytes. So here, just trying to. So this this is the this is the least significant, and you want to use it here, right? And this is gonna be used here. Okay. So if 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 you sometimes as guys, uh, so we got a good question. Is your friend that is asking why do we have such convention? Because I can't just read sometimes from the last, and and I can't just assign from the the first. Otherwise. I'm not sure when I'm when I'm trying to access this and when I'm trying to access the and assign the next variable in my stack. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know gonna lost. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. That's just you have to pick one convention. Okay. Yeah. Is there any advantage using the That's a good question. I'm I'm not sure. Um Perhaps there are. I'll, I'll, I'll check it for you for the next section. Yeah, but that's a good question. Yep. In one register? Which of the registers? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. Sorry? Yeah, because it so that is being stored into um, that address, but is it actually being stored in four different addresses? Because, because it starts at um, 20. So the, the way risk 5 goes is uh, addressing in memory goes byte by byte. So each memory address, when you increment, uh, when, when, you, when you traverse that in the stack, is like one, so like from 0 to 1 and 1 to 2, you are traversing one byte, right? So actually storing it in four? Yeah, yeah. Instead of just one? Yeah, that's right. So um, I've, I've put another one here, actually here. So here, this is your this is your memory, right? So now is so your first the starts as zero, right? So the next the the second one is eight because you're one byte up, and then so on and so forth, right? It's your memory in risk five. So now we have another code here. 
So we are trying to add edge plus the eighth element of A, okay? And we want to store that in 12 element of I. So the array A, A12 now has edge plus A8, right? So, first of all, H is in X21. Why? Okay. We had it perhaps somewhere saved. And then, now we want to make sure we are collecting, we, we are fetching the 8 and the 8 location of 8, right? So, we need to have, yeah? So, why is Egypt so Repeat the question? Why is Egypt next to Because it, 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 was serve, uh, it was saved perhaps in the previous instructions and we had it ready already, yeah. So, now we want to access A of 8, right? The 8th position of array 8. Uh, array A, right? So since the addressing starts byte by byte, so if I want to fetch the result of this value, where should I look at? So I have to go eight times by eight, right? Because each of those addresses are bytes. So that the, the zero byte represents A of zero, the eighth represents A1, 16 represents A2, and so on and so forth. So if I, if I want to have this available, I need to <coughs> load 64 and store it in X22. Is that clear? So here. In this case, since since we started them from zero, we we base it to zero. But you, you can just start in the middle of a program, and you need another pointer to start that offset for you. So basically, S twenty two is a pointer to tell you where the yeah, is that's right, and that's one of those pointers that you saw in the register, like a uh, frame pointer, a stack pointer, yeah. And the S twenty two and S nine will be register, save register, um, as well, right? Right, right, right. Exactly. So now, so now we are accessing this in, in this side, uh, in this address of memory, and then be loading it to X9 now, right? So this represents a load instruction. Now I'm, I'm in this in this um, you know session. I'm just giving you some high uh, high level ideas. We we're gonna focus on each of those uh, starting from next lecture. So you actually know exactly what's happening when you load, when you add, when you see, when you uh, shift or or any of those other you know um, ISAs. So this just this will give you a, a, an overview of how the things are working. Yep. Question. First one, what is offset actually means? Like this word. What is what? Offset. Offside? Yeah. Oh, I see. It's it, it's offset. Yeah. Yeah. What is what is index? Yeah. What is index eight requires offset of sixty-four actually? So suppose so a zero in this case starts from zero, which is this, right? A one. The address would be 8 for that. And then if you go up to eight, A8, you need to look for address 64, right? In computer architecture, we say, so we have to offset it by 64 because we have to start from here to 64 and find the value corresponding to that. Because each of those addresses are, they call it byte address location, yeah. yeah. No. It is, is, is another variable that we stored before. So we are using it to, to add to AA8. Yeah. That's right. Yep. 
what is X9? X9 is another register that you load the result of this to that. Okay. And what's SD? Uh, no, SD is store. I mean, if, do you have to have the book? You can have a look at on, on the green sheet. And, but, but you don't have to worry, because we, we're going to touch on all of those later. Yeah. Sorry, uh, so we look at the 64 uh, bytes. It's stored at 22, and then loaded to 9. It's 9 stored. How, how did you explain it? No, actually, it's 22. It's 22. Had already, so it's, it's like two, two different instructions. So we are looking at the address of the 64 to find that it's 22 value that corresponds to a loaded Questions? So, sir, a safe register can save, like, an entire array? Up to its size. So it's up to double word. If it, it depends, I mean, if you're storing a huge amount, you need to just find other ways to shift and break it and, yeah, all sort of things that we learn later. Why is that 96 here? Like, I don't see the pattern. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read you that. We are still at the first line now. Okay. So now we, we, we are up to the point. Yep. So if we had two, let's say we had a zero there. We don't have to use this one. If we had a zero, yeah. we had to use zero. Right. Instead of 64, zero x 23, yeah. That's right. Sir, can you just explain that uh, mode line again? Which line? The LB, X9, 64. Okay, so x 22 is the register containing the results of A, right? That A is on that register. So when you access the address of 64 on, on X22, it's going to actually fetch the A of 8 for us. Right? And then finally, when we wanted to store it back, we are storing it in what? 12, right? In the, in the number 12. So if you carry on going higher, after 64, 4 of 4, 8 more, so you're going to reach up to 96, right? So now you want to update. A12, which is X96 address of X22. Yeah, we are actually overriding it. I mean, that, that's fine. But that's fine right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Because because we don't need that we don't need the temporary. Yeah, okay, so guys, um, there's a question here. Um, so I told you that risk five has thirty two registers of sixty four, right? And we call a thirty two bit a word. Thus sixty four bits called the double word. The double board is like you are using all the 64 bits of that specific register, right? Because the register XN, whatever that is, has 64. So each of them are 8, right? 8, 8, 8, 8. So these two, we call it one word. Another word. The whole, we call it double word. Now, I'm sure you didn't see it, but yeah. We call all of them double work. It's, it's a temporary register that we, we use it to add and then we override it again. So so we are loading we are loading the address sixty four of register X twenty two and that corresponds to A eight. So we are loading it to this. Okay. So remember that this side is not available in, in CPU, it's on memory, right? You have to find it in a specific location in memory and load it and then use it again. Okay? Is there a name for 96? Because 64 is no double. No, no, no. Double it's, it, 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 is still, uh, it is still double board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you say base, I guess I'm A, B, A0. Yes. Or, or wherever it was started. Perhaps if, if you if you're running uh, and you're running in the middle of your code.
perhaps your base was like two million. Who knows? But there is another point that shows your base. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That a question? Yeah. All right. So let's have a comparison about registers and memory. By now you understood that we have 32 registers. They are pretty fast. We want to make sure that we are using them. But many times, in, in, in quite often, uh, we need to access memory, right? So in general, registers are way, way faster than uh, a memory access, right? And as you just saw, operating on memory requires loads and store. So here we were trying to make some of these values available to, um, to us. So we had to just check on memory in a specific address and load them and store them again, right? And it was on the uh, memory side. So operating on memory thus requires loads and stores. And thus, in order to do that, with a very simple instruction that you saw, uh, more instructions should be executed to do this task. And you know, in, in compiler domain, they, they try to optimize the process to use registers as much as possible. I was just telling you guys five minutes ago, if you if you run your uh, if you compile your high level code like Java, C, C++, with um, with a general purpose comp uh, compiler like GCC, LLVM, or Intel ICC, um, many of the instances they are not using registers; they're just using memory in order to run. If you want to force your compiler, um, first of all, if the compiler was enabled to use registers, first of all, and secondly, if you wanted to force your compiler to use the registers, you need to instruct them with special instructions, right? In, in Intel, that's why we, we use SSE format. It's a little bit lower than, uh, you know, C or C++, but that SSE, for instance, SSE 4.1, 4.2, makes sure that some of the instructions are actually using registers, right? Um, does anyone use SSE so far? Has anyone written SSE? SSE. Um, so what you really know is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, just, just just to let you know that um, sometimes when you want to uh, completely leverage your CPU, uh, just writing uh, a Java code or a C++ code or a C# -sharp code is not enough. Most of the applications that you are using, most of the commercial ones, they are specifically optimized and tuned for a specific hardware, right? So those developers actually wrote. In SSC, if, if they were using in, uh, Intel, you know, hardware, or using other intrinsics, if, if they were using, uh, you know, other than Intel, so uh, those codes look like more like assembly rather than a high-level language, right? So it's just another language for. An it's another. Code. It's a little bit lower level than your high high high-level C or C plus plus code, right? Okay. But you're making you're forcing compiler that use these specific registers for this, right? Other than that, some of the uh, you know more advanced say programmers they just completely write in assembly. They just when they want to write something. I mean, most of the applications that you're using, even your cell phone, that they are running super fast and they're competing in market, they have all been written in assembly directly. Like they have people people that they can understand assembly and then they write in assembly. Yeah. Explain why a register is different from a cache. Because register is inside your CPU module. And a cache is not? No, it, 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 it's still within that reach, but uh, it's, it's further uh, further away. And your register is using the same uh, ISA as your CPU, right? You don't have to change it, or you're going to have to access oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's just there. Yeah. Okay. Also, yeah. from like a purely hardware perspective. Faster, yeah, so yeah. Really it is much, much faster. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, I have a real question. Java and C, Java is C will be faster than Java, right? It's 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 just like you're saying. Um, Ferrari is faster or Porsche. I mean, it depends on the driver. It depends on the, the road. Yeah, because I I have a very weird Java I have to go through like uh, barriers, like more barriers to reach to the pits. In general, the higher the language is, it is the, slower, right? yeah, it is easier to work with, but it might be slower, okay. unless you have a very good compiler that understands how to parse the program and you know produce that optimized code for you. Okay. Yeah.
Okay. So le let me give you an example. For instance, uh, many of the Android phones, uh, Android phones that are uh, you know produced by Qualcomm, uh, all the Snapdragon phones, they have a specific processors. They call it accelerators, and they're designed to run some of your machine learning applications like uh, face recognition or smile detection. So those softwares have been written 99% in, in, in assembly by the specific engineers in Qualcomm or elsewhere that they run super fast. The, I mean, for instance, the smile detection or just when you take a photo, it just, you know, process the, your image in less than a fraction of a second. So most of them are running in, in a special code. They're not in high-level languages. If you, if you could have written those in high-level languages, but it would take like three seconds. Whereas these optimized versions might run in 30 milliseconds, right? And they have to beat the market. So for them, it's very important to, to make it as optimized as possible. So these are the advantages of uh, you know, working in lower level languages or just writing in high level languages, which is more friendly and you know, um, more beautiful, one might say. It. So this is the way it is. OK. All right, so where were we? So let's talk about another set of operands. We talked about some few examples about arithmetic. Um, so let's talk about another sort of operands that, that, uh, that we want to focus on. And they call immediate. And that's what that I means here in add. So if we were to add two variables or two registers in, in the variables, so we would have used add, right? Since, but since one of them is, is a number, it, is a constant, right? So there is a special um, ins instruction for that called add i, and that represents that I'm going to add 4 to x22 and store it back here, right? So now you can distinguish between adding 2 a and b as variables or adding a plus 4, right? And this is much, much faster because constants are processed much faster than. Okay? And this immediate, another advantage is it's going to avoid a load instruction for you because you don't have to just load it, you can just process it right away. Where are those keywords of where are those keywords stored? Yeah, I mean, they, they are not actually stored physically, but they are embedded inside a chip. So when you want to, uh, when you want to, uh, when you when you use that compiler that emits that code, it it, it knows that what opcode to output, okay, so and what and, and what binary to output, okay. right? And that binary is can be executable on that specific hardware. Okay, but it, but I only mean by means that then there's not a lot of keywords being stored in a small chip. Right? Yeah, I mean in, in the RISC V we have only 32 registers, okay. and we have. Some opcodes you can have it. You can have a look at it on the first. Does anyone have the book? I can show it to the other guys. Uh, you have the book? <laughs> Nobody obtained the book. Oh, I see. <laughs> you have perhaps torrented it. <laughs> Nobody has the book. Great. So wherever you download the book, you download the green sheet as well. That, that green card. It's there. Yeah, it's, it's there. Okay, okay so like, can we just like, go to the library and like, take the green card out then? Yeah, just clear it out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but you'll be the only yeah. user then. Um, if, if you take a look at the, if you take a look at the wiki page, I guess I've, um, I've, I've sent some link for you guys to, to perhaps have a look at it. I'll, I'll migrate those to, to Moodle later on. <laughs> All right. So we talked about the arithmetic operations. We talked about immediate operations. Now let's talk about how how we're gonna deal with sine, plus and minus in binary integers, right? So as you know. As you know, we are uh, we are dealing with a binary board, right? So it's either zero or two, and we are 
if uh, in order to uh, you know understand what the value of a number is in decimal, you have to convert it this way. So, say as an example here, this this number, 64 bit, right? So these three dots shows that they're all zero up to this point, and the last four are one zero one one, and this two represents that this number is a binary number, right? If you were if you were to write one in in hex or in 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 decimal, we would have just write like I don't know eight seven blah blah, blah and then we would have put ten here or sixteen here or two. This shows that this number is in that specific convention, right? So now, if you want to if you want to uh, um, convert this, how are we going to do that, right? This is a very intuitive formula. Since all of them are zero, you don't have to do anything about them, right? X n minus one multiply two to the raise of n minus one. So they are all zero up to the point that we have this last four. So the very last one is always one. X zero, two to the raise of zero is always one, and shows the last one, which is this, right? This one shows this one. And the other two are that. So the only thing in the specific example given that we have to calculate is the last four. So one multiplied to the raise of three, which is n minus one. Uh, I'm sorry, n, n, n minus n plus uh, two, which is three, and then zero, which is this number multiplied to the raise of two. And these are the last two that you saw over there. So this binary number actually means 11, right? In decimal. That's why we put that 10 underneath that as sub uh, as subscript. Okay, is that clear? So now, if you want to calculate the upper bound, how did we come up with this number? Did they um, take all eight bits, turn into ones, and then that convert to a decimal? Right. So if if you have these 64 bits, right, and you, the maximum number that this uh, space can show is what? When all of them are 1, right? And if you compute that using that formula, you're going to end up having this. So that's the highest no value a 64-bit system can present, right? So if, if you recall some years ago, I'm, I'm sure it's uh, perhaps it was in my time, uh, before 64-bit before, uh, systems, we used to have 32-bit systems, right? So some of you, and you had a limitation in RAM usage, right? right? So 32 systems, I believe the, the limit was like around 3 gigabytes of RAM. So uh, in order to use more of your RAM, say you had even 16 gigabytes of RAM available, but since your system was 32-bit, your, your OS, your perhaps your Windows, you, you, you wouldn't be able to take use of the rest of your RAM because the addressing wouldn't you know, let it go. So if you were to use all of that, you had to reinstall it with a 64-bit OS. I'm sorry. How did they uh, change that? To so uh, the hardware actually so, uh, were supporting 64. At that at the time, that was an OS limitation. Okay. It was a Windows 32 bit. Okay. But the hardware beneath was designed to to you know work with both 32 and 64, okay. right? But if the hardware doesn't know, for sure you can't install that. Are there specific hardware where like you only have 64 bit? I mean, now most uh, could be. But most of them supports both way. Perhaps, yeah. You think it's possible to create hardware that goes beyond 64 bit? Yeah, there are 128 bits, but you need to uh, either change completely change a new 
uh, and devise your own ISA, and then after that you have to completely change the way you, you assign and you search the memory. Your opcodes would be higher, larger because they are 128. Everything is going to be, you know, more complex. I'd say, yeah. Because remember, is is everything is is uh, is completely logical here, right? So by changing one thing in the middle, you have to change the whole spectrum. All right. So now, let's see another another type of operations we can do with that. So two complements for sign images, uh, sign integers. So, <coughs> here, the largest, no, the, the, the largest integer we could have shown, because it was unsigned, right? We didn't, we, uh, we didn't care about the sign of that number. It was always plus. That's why I have this. However, if, if you want to make sure that we have signed values, right? How are we going to represent that? Because we only have 64 bits. So we need to at least find a way to use one of those or several of those to, to showcase to the compiler and the hardware beneath that this value is not a positive value, perhaps it's a negative one, right? But taking use of that single bit, for instance, in this case, the, the most significant bit, the one, so say you have... Um, say you had... Uh, can I wait? So you had 64 here. Right? If if you are if you don't care about the, the sign, so you can use them all, right? All of them could be one. But if you want to take into account the sign number. So what we're going to do here, we take use of the first one, and that's going to be the sign bit. And then we have now 30, 63 left here, right? Whereas we had 64 here. So if it was 0 or 1, that shows that the number is either positive or negative, right? This is a pretty neat convention we can use to define minus and pluses. However, using this, we're going to lose half of the upper bound we had, right? Instead of that 18 trillion, million, whatever the number was, now we have 9 from minus 9 to plus 9. Is that clear why? So now using this, with that sign bit, we can show from this number, the smallest number we can show in a 64-bit, to the highest number with the sign value. It's because we start from 0 and not 1. It's, it's, we have 64 bits, we start from 0 to 63, okay. and then again there, when, when we combine it, uh, it's, it's one less. So you say it is including sign, so yeah. just minus, minus to not minus, and then the yeah. bottom one to be positive. Yeah, if, if you see, it's 15 at the end, Yeah. that that is 8 and 7. Yeah, that's, that's the word of confusion. <laughs> 8 plus 7 is 15. Yeah. Oh. Can you explain again? What nine? Oh, here. This is it. If you add the so, if you so, I was talking about this. Uh, let me find some space here. So, in in the old system, when you didn't have, I mean, it's not an old. It's it just different conventions. If you are in unsigned version, so I'm gonna say unsigned. So you can take use of all of those 64, right? If you are in sign mode, what you have access is one for the sign bit, and you have 63, because this is reserved, right? 
So now, if this one is set, one, that shows a negative number. So you have these values to play with. If this is set to zero, the other way around, that shows the other side of the spectrum, you have 63 bits to represent your offer bound, right? And this makes that 18 uh, with all those values to two nines, minus nine, two plus nine. That's why from here, from zero to here, is as if we go from minus nine to plus one, plus nine. Okay. So, that's why here, that number you saw is actually these two, right? So the most negative one and the most positive one. So, after we saw how we're going to represent sign and unsigned, let's, let's see how we're going to play around with sign negation, right? So we are negating a, a variable, so it, as if we have like 20, it's going to be minus 20. Or you have a minus 20, it's going to make it plus 20. We're just negating that, right? And that's what, is, what does this bar show here. Okay. In computer uh, architecture, when we say a complement, right? A complement means a one has turning to zero, so zero is a complement of one, and the other way around, and zero turn to one, right? So for sign negation, we are actually talking about complement and add one, and that's why when you add x plus x bar, its own complement is going to return to minus one. On the other hand, if you add x bar plus 1, it's going to return minus x, right? And if you want to show it here, in binary, that's going to be how you do that. So, let me just wrap this up with, with the next slide. Um, so for sign extension, so if you have many conventions in, 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 in different architectures, um, there are many ways that people have done it, but it's just a matter of you know, having a convention and just follow through on that, right? So in risk five, the instruction said, this LB is a convention for you sign extend loaded byte, and LBU is for zero extend load byte. So we're gonna talk on this more next session. So just make sure on Monday after the class we have the first lab for those have, who have assigned in lab 01 and on Tuesday is for the lab 02. Meanwhile check your Moodle and uh, find the pre-labs on Friday. Yeah, good night.